Leo Simpson, thanks for joining this call. Very excited to have you. Uh, the topic here is how to write a book. And we've been having this theme for the month of time management, productivity, uh, how to manage your calendar, how to time block your calendar. We've been running through a lot of exercises. And as part of the community, I noticed that you had written eight books. And I thought to myself, well, here's a guy who knows how to manage his time effectively enough to go ahead and pen eight books. So I thought that was incredible alone. So kudos on that. And I thought it'd be, you know, really awesome for you to share some value to our group and, you know, to the world on your approach towards writing books and, and how you got it done. And how does one person actually accomplish writing so many books in such a short period of time? So I'm excited to kind of get into those topics. And before we jump into it, maybe you can share a little bit about your background on who you are and how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. One of the cool things uh, that you said was, you know, manage your time well enough. <laughs> That's very important. I wouldn't say that I'm a master at it, but I've learned how to master what I need to master. Um, to give a synopsis, um, I'm Leo Simpson II, of course. And the cool part about that is the second part. Um, my mother named me after my father, Leonard Earl Simpson II. And the interesting aspect of that is when I first started writing my name in school, I actually tried to write Leonard Simpson. And she was like, oh, no, <laughs> that's your father's name. And so when you take that little piece and add it to everything um, that is and who I am, uh, it starts with, of course, my father, because, you know, that's the first place for my identity. But uh, beyond that, there's this journey of experience and, you know, work and learning how to work and learning how to be focused and how to be intentional, how to serve and all those different things. And so that's led me to uh, a career where at this stage of my life, 20 plus years, I've actually worked in over four different industries. Some have overlapped uh, and it's positioned me to be not just an entrepreneurship, not just be an author, be a strategist, but also be a business professor. And one of the things that I found to be very interesting in being a business professor, I've been doing so for uh, right at a year or so now, is that when you teach business, you have to be able to understand a lot of different things of business. And there's so many different layers that you're touching with these students at the very basic level in a short period of time. And I begin to look back at my career and see how it may not have been so valuable for a career at a stable place, but it was perfect for me to be able to be one, an entrepreneur, and two, to be able to be a professor. So uh, today, my niche is the wellness space and I focus on helping people to replace chaos, frustration, and confusion in their work, family, and identity with wellness. And so it's a huge benefit to be able to be called the wellness professor. I love it. It's such a great niche and it's often not easy to kind of find your little corner of the universe, but it's really important. And you know, I think there's a lot of benefits once you find it, because then you can create somewhat of a brand around it. Then people start knowing how to think about you and how Absolutely. to talk about you when you're not in the room. That's Absolutely. Absolutely. Matter of fact, um, there's a project that's being worked on um, from a podcast standpoint. I can't really say where it is, but because uh, they haven't really rolled it out, but um, it's in the higher education space, and I'll actually be doing a segment on this podcast, kind of like, you know, how you have a radio show, and then you got the different segments. I'll be doing a segment, and it'll be focused on wellness within the context of teaching and learning, and man, it's a cool little thing to do, so you, you hit the nail right on the head. Yeah, I love it. That's really cool. So so let's turn the corner on talking about books. Sure. So you've written eight books. Uh, when did you get the idea to start writing books? How did that come to you? Man, uh, you know, like we said in a previous conversation, it, it was something that was a thought when I was a kid. Um, I can't really say at what point when I was a kid where it was like, I want to write books, but 
I remember there were times where I would see books and see authors and things of that sort. And it's, you know, you kind of have that little idea in the back of your mind where it really began to be a, a corner turn for me was my grandfather in his eighties wrote his first book. He ended up before he passed away, he wrote two books and he had a very unique approach to it in that, you know, he was a pastor and, you know, he he was very intentional about everything he did because he wanted to not just, you know, communicate a solid message, but he wanted there to be this experience with it. And his book was talking about the dangers of unforgiveness. And <laughs> he actually did not have this book edited at all, right? And he told me, afterward because I asked him I was like come on Paul Paul you know you could have got with me right like you know your grandson go make sure you're good and he he said no nah, this is what the way I was supposed to do it and he said the main reason aside from a couple others was that the not having it edited edited was in order to be connected with the reality of unforgiveness being harbored in people's hearts now it's a subliminal situation in reality but nonetheless it was something that the person would be able to deal with and have their own wrestle with and so him writing that book and writing it that way is where it put me in a place to where I could see that I could write a book with my own focus my own intent my own purpose my own ideology because of the experiences that I want to create for people. And so that was like the corner turn where it was like, I'm going to write a book. Because, you know, when you see somebody do something in a certain way, it resonates sure. with you. And at that point, I would say that was probably somewhere around the time that uh, I hadn't, I wasn't, I may have been like 30, 31 or somewhere in there. And literally, I was like, man, I, I got to do this. and so I made a goal. I said, I'm going to write 70 books in 35 years, which meant that by the time I was 35, I needed to be on the course to at least be doing like two books a year. And literally, I published my first two books when I was 35, I think. <laughs> wow. And um, the the biggest reason why I decided that I needed to write was because I needed to leave behind perspective and awareness, not just for the world to know and to see and to benefit from, but for my generations. And I saw that if I had, for example, 70 books, I would have a solid amount of intellectual property assets that would be able to be utilized for various different generations. And they could literally create a business, a strategy, a product, a service around that content. And so I was like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. And so that's one of the main ways that that really got started for me. That's really cool. So no easy feat. You've penned eight books. Uh, I want to talk technically about how you get this done, because I think a lot of writers or want to be writers, people that have wanted to write a book, a script or anything, they get stuck with, uh, you know, writer's block or they just don't know where to get started. So in your process, and I'm sure every author has different processes, but what has been your process? How do you get started in this? So how I get started is I get started with experience. Um, it, it really starts with, on the one hand, an idea and an idea that's in the context of what I'm dealing with in life. I'll give you an example. So my first book, first of all, I was like, if I'm going to write 70 books, I got to at least write one book. <laughs> so I had to do the first one, right? And for the first one, you know, I looked into what was I doing at that time? Like, what was the thing that was like major for me? And this has be become a very staple approach for me in all of my books that it's something that becomes constant or consistent in the context of what I'm doing. And so what ended up happening was where I was working at the time, I was dealing a lot with teamwork. I was dealing a lot with aspects of engagement with 
other people, your clients, the company level, the vendors, all those different things. I was working with a service company and I was working very closely with one of the technicians in the company that I was with. And like we were dealing with some very specific thought processes, which ended up becoming the main context of my first book, which is entitled The Two Keys for Highly Exceptional Teams. So the the title came as a result of the things that I was dealing with on a regular. And then the thought processes, the ideas, the stories, they just flowed from there. And so where I really go is I go to, in my notes section, I have these running notes where if I get an idea, I'll put the, the title down first. Because a lot of times it's a title that comes with an idea for me. Then I'll go through and if it's something that continues to be rehashed in my mind, then I'll start to say, okay, let me go ahead and put some bullet points down. Let me start looking at, okay, what are the main ideas? What are the main, maybe main three points or maybe five points that I'm going to really touch on? Then I get those down. And then from there, I start building chapters around that. Like, what does it look like for that to flow through, right? Uh, do, am I going to have a preface? Am I going to have a forward? Am I going to have an introduction? Am I just going to get straight to the point? Uh, how am I going to structure my table of contents? You know, all those little details. And all of that is just like an organic process where I'm doing it as I'm walking through. So as I go throughout my day to day, I'll stop. I have a thought. I'll just go and jot it down and I keep it moving so that this is not like I'm having to sit down and do it. This is in the context of life. Here's why. For me, I don't write anything with my hands except for the notes that I put down. And even sometimes I'll take that and hit the microphone and say, oh, da, 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 right? The reason I don't write my books with my hand, be it writing it with pen or typing it, is because I think so much faster than I type or write. I'm not a stenographer, <laughs> not a court reporter, don't have that skill set. When it comes to long form, I have to be able to talk it out. So the biggest thing is once I'm at that point to where I'm ready to start putting information to page, it's now time to talk. And so you got to have a good microphone. I actually currently have a Blue Yeti microphone. When I started, I didn't have Blue Yeti, uh, but I had a microphone that could capture what it is that I need to capture. And then from there, you know, there are other aspects in the process, but that's how you get started with it. Yeah, I, I love that. I love the idea of starting with experience. I think very often authors, uh, they have an idea of something that someone wants to read and they may not have any experience with it. You see it on social media a lot. People just kind of want to be known, but they're, they don't have kind of the deep roots. So I love the fact that you're connecting what you're living to a story, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm book because then it becomes real and then the the fact that you talk about it versus writing it because you know going back to the writer's block thing not everyone is a writer I, I've been a writer my whole life but not everyone's great at just sitting down and writing but everybody talks we talk all day mm -hmm. long right so mm -hmm. being able to grab the microphone and just put your ideas out there and then have those transcribed speaking of transcription uh, what tools are you using to transcribe when you write I know uh, Google Docs has a transcription there's apps out there. I believe you're a Microsoft guy, but tell us a little bit more about that. So what's interesting is from a tech, from a, from a systems perspective, I'm a Mac guy. All right. Okay. So okay. we, we going to have Mac working in the, in the queue as it pertains to the, the, um, the actual software that I use. I actually use Microsoft word. I use the online version of it. I have a, um, a Microsoft Outlook account or a OneDrive account and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm able to make use of that. And and what's really cool is that when I first started, I started using Google Docs, right? And using Google Docs was good, except for, for me, the transcription would like time out, right? And I needed something that would just keep going. Now, I didn't really know when I started using Microsoft Word, that the transcription function did not time out, but I was like, I need something else. So let me try this and see if it works. Works very well. Literally, I have to go and stop it. <laughs> like, hey, I'm done. You know, if, if you're silent for a little while 
and I, I don't remember what that time frame is. It'll it'll stop, but um, ultimately it'll go as long as you want to go, right? So if you got a good microphone that's you know able to really capture your voice and you enunciate very well, you can have some very high accuracy in how that transcription works. That was another thing that because of the 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 timeout aspect of the transcription function in Google Docs. It for me, because I would kind of sometimes have a certain pace that I'm at with my, you know, articulation, it wouldn't really capture it the way that I want it to. So it wasn't as robust as I want it to be. But once I found uh, that Microsoft Word had actually had a lot of updates, they have a very solid editing tool that's in the context of their software. Uh, they also have the ability for you to take an audio and then upload it to Microsoft Word, and it'll actually do the transcribing for you. So I use the dictate function where I'm going direct from mouth to page, right? But they have it to where you can actually have audio, and it will actually do transcription for you. So I haven't used that yet. Uh, that's probably a project that I'll use in the near future because, you know, I just kind of want to test it out. But that dictation function, man, you click that microphone in there and it gets to work, especially if you got a good microphone that's able to really capture your voice very well. That That's awesome. That's such a, a good nugget there. Uh, you know, you said something profound when we were talking last time about sing the book cover. <laughs> I was holding bit. on to that one. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, when... So I kind of left that out because I figured you would probably bring it up because uh, that's one of those unique pieces that really brings the whole, um, the whole, um, I, won't, I won't say discovery, the whole process of actually creation together. So you go to that process where I talk about putting the information in the notes and kind of setting it up. Before I really start putting anything to page, the first thing I ask myself is, can I see the cover, right? Can I see what this cover looks like? Because once I've gotten to a point to where I I really, I'm going to say feel. And the reason I say feel is because in the context of, of human nature, we have mind, will, emotions, right? Which is our thoughts, our beliefs, and our desires, and then our feelings. And when you have thought on something long enough, what happens is that thought translates to a belief. That belief then becomes solidified to a desire that then moves into our emotions, which is our energy emotions, which we start to feel this thing without having to think it. It becomes innate. And the feelings is where we actually start to get into the context of now let's take action, right? And so for me, before I really get to that point to where I started putting words to page i gotta see that that uh that cover meaning i have a picture in here but if the picture has become so defined that i can see it with my physical eyes that's when i know this book is now live and ready to to come to life right this is when the true manifested work takes place and so i'll go in because at the point that i feel like I have a cover, I have to go and actually see what I'm seeing in my imagination. And if I can see on my screen in Canva what it is that I'm doing in my head with a picture, it's time for this thing to come out. Yeah. It's kind of like labor and delivery time for real. <laughs> oh, it's cool. It's like water is broken. <laughs> you're getting yourself into an emotional state. Mm -hmm. And that emotional state is creating this energy and that energy kind of propels you forward versus um, just kind of sitting in your room and in, in a cold, dark space in the corner with a laptop and hoping something hits you. You're being proactive about this creativity and saying, let me jump into Canva. Let, let me create a cover. And once I see it, then now I can really like latch on to what this thing is. And then that propels you forward. I think that's such a great, I don't want to call it a hack, but like a great tool. Oh, it's a hack. Okay, great. Great it's hack. A hack. <laughs> it, it's it's a hack because what what I've done at that point is I've actually made made certain that this is real, right? Yeah. And 
when I see the cover, I'm looking at it at that point that this is going to be online. This is going to be something that is going to be in people's hands. Like I'm having this experience with where this book can very likely go and really don't even know what's going to happen. So it's really a huge hack of excellence and execution because I've actually subverted this process of, oh, like you said, you know, we don't live in the permission world anymore, and anymore, right? I gave myself permission. And when I see that cover, permission granted. Yeah, I love it. Well, okay, so we covered the technical aspect of how you go about writing a book with uh, the dictation, with Word, uh, using a good microphone, going through Canva, starting with experience kind of breaking down into sub chapters, getting like three to five really good salient points that you want to address inside your book. So that's the technical aspect. Let's take a step back and talk about the benefits of writing a book. What benefits have you seen in your personal professional career from taking this effort, taking this leap to write these books and put them out there? You know, one, one of the things I saw as a benefit from a personal level was that I was building solid credibility with myself, right? Um, when I say credibility, on the one hand, it's a matter of, I said I was going to do it and I'm doing it, right? Now, you know, it remains to be seen 70 books, but at the core, I've done more than I had when I first started, you know, when I first made the statement. Um, on the other hand, it's it's a matter of, I talk about this a lot in the context of wellness, that when you release value, you experience an immediate void. But as immediate as you experience a void, there's this re-emergence or this emergence, if you will, of value that was waiting to emerge, right? And that's in the context of our unlimited, unfulfilled potential. And so what I've discovered is that every book that I've written, it's actually caused me to become more mature. Uh, it's caused me to become more settled because I, I stopped feeling like I had a lot to say. I said it and now I've moved on to the next thing. And so literally, I put myself then from a professional standpoint in a place to where I have created asset upon asset upon asset upon asset and now I'm chasing assets more than anything and that means that I can go into my back my uh my back room and actually say you know what I have this thing over here as an idea and I can literally actually take this thing that I have in on the shelf back here bring it out and I can build around it I can build an e-course around it I can build a speaking uh, approach around it. I can actually go and take this and help build a company for somebody. I can give them this book, tell them to study it and say, hey, does this make a difference to you? Is this something that speaks to you? Now let's actually create a whole strategy for you. Like it gives me versatility yeah. because I've put myself in a position to where I have something of an asset that has so much infinite potential that is waiting for me to access it, whether I'm going to do something with it or not. Like I said, it could be for the future as well, right? The other benefits that I have seen is that writing these books has given me immediate authority, right? With people, like just telling people, yeah, you know, I've written a number of books. Whoa, you're an author, right? They automatically see you as somebody that is an authority because in many instances, you did something they might want to do, but then you did something that they, they think is very honorable, right? It, it speaks to people being at this high level of excellence. And again, like you said, what's different for me than, than a lot of people, not all people, is that like I'm coming from experience. I'm not telling you something somebody told me. I'm telling you something that I'm either mustering through or I've actually done or I'm still perfecting or whatever the case may be. So there's a huge level of authority there. The other thing is it gives you freedom with your ideas, right? When, when you know that you can take something and you can be disciplined in capturing it, 
and and creating this idea, this construct, this concept, this experience around it, it gives you the ability to create other things with greater ease. So every time I write a book, I get better with my creative ability. I get better with my ability to be strategic. All the different constructs that help people be successful, it's in the context of writing a book. And so there's so many benefits that I didn't even touch on, but at the core, you experience profound growth because of taking on that process. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, I forgot exactly what the saying is, but it's along the lines of if you really want to master something, you need to learn how to teach it. And yes, you see this a lot with uh, musicians where later in their career, they'll start becoming professors at music schools and whatnot, because they're getting deeper and deeper and deeper to the work and it helps them understand it better. And it's almost like a selfish endeavor in some regards, because they're trying to understand it more and more and more. And the only way to understand it more is to teach it. Uh, and I think what you're doing here by putting it out there is helping you understand your subject matter more. Um, let me ask you about time, because everything you're talking about here <laughs> is really, you know, it sounds phenomenal, right? If I didn't know you, I'd be like, oh my gosh, this sounds great. Intellectual property, you're crushing it. This must have taken you years, is my original thought. How long has it typically taken you to write some of these books from the shortest to, let's say, the longest? So the shortest I did in like five days. It's crazy. The longest was, I think, four weeks. Still not, still not very long. No. And the reason that that can even be the case is one of the premises that I operated with when I first started writing books, like when I wrote my first one, one of the things that I had to do, which was kind of like a hack, was I had to I had to look at something that I had done to tell me that I could do what it is that I was thinking. Like I, I refuted the whole idea that it takes a year to write a book or it takes, you know, two years and whatever. And it's not because it doesn't. It's because the way that I felt about the content, I didn't think it took that long. And that's one of the reasons that I talk it out because it's a conversation. It's a, it's an experience as if somebody's standing in front of me, me teaching them or speaking to them in an event. And I was like, I just cannot fathom if it takes me 40 minutes or 30 minutes or two hours, six hours seminar, whatever the case may be to get all of this to these people. And it can be transformation in their life. It takes me a whole year to do that with a book. I was like, that doesn't make sense. And so the thing that I pointed to in my mind was 2019 is where I wrote my first book. I finished my master's in December of 2018. And in that year of 2019, just kind of like thinking about the thought process, looking at my age, I said, when I was in my master's program, I was writing 10 page papers, sometimes like weekly. And they had to be high level research and all these types of things. And I had to get myself in a vacuum in order to get it done. You know, the family understood you got to make this happen because you got this much time, so on and so forth. And I was like, I wasn't, I was getting a grade for those. And I wasn't even in a position to where it could be positioned as intellectual property. I was like, this right here, I can take that same experience because I know I can do it at a high level, not deal with typing, but actually deal with talking. And guess what? I can get the same results. And the book that I wrote in like five days, it's a short book, but it was one of those things where when I did it in that five day period, it was things happening in the environment where it's like, I need to get this out by this time. And I was also kind of like testing myself. Can I do it? Like, what can I do? So when you get into the context of writing the books, the way that I do you you put yourself in this incubator of challenging yourself in ways and, you know, testing your limits and all that kind of stuff. That's really exciting. So uh, when I thought about what I did in my graduate studies, I was like, I can make this happen. And after I did it for that first book, it was on and popping from there. And what happened was, I, I never told you this, my first book, I published somewhere around Thanksgiving. My second book, this is 2019, my second book I published on Christmas Eve wow. of that same year. Wow. And it was connected with, 
I wrote the first book. My dad passed like, I think a week after I wrote the first book. And in that moment, it was like, what, man, I, I need to do something with this moment. And I even discovered that, you know, writing was a way for me to deal with grief in a way, right. you know, talking out what I was sharing. And literally I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually write a book as a memorial to my dad, but it's also going to be some lessons that can be beneficial for other people who may have never had their father or they had their father and their father didn't teach them certain things. So I'm just going to put it in there. And that's what we did. It was called my daddy said. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a great way to honor your father as well. Um, what about the editing process? Like who helps you with editing and getting it all kind of dialed and ready to go out? I'm assuming you're using Kindle Direct Publishing or so. So Kindle Direct Publishing, which is the the um, publishing side of Amazon, they do offer things like that, but I haven't taken advantage of it um, simply because the cool part is I can do it all myself right now at least simply because i'm not exhausting myself with the typing for putting it down when i go in to edit it's a different hat that i'm putting on yeah. right so uh, i can actually get into that process and get intimate with the book in a very unique way now in the future my plan is to have a couple layers one i would be still kind of like a a first level editor of my books because I want to make sure it still feels like I want it to be. And, and that's something that I just cannot erase from that process because when I talk it out, I need to go back and feel it differently from the person who's hearing it. I need to feel it from what I thought versus what actually is. Uh, the next layer will very likely be I have someone inside of my family. In, in many cases, that might be my oldest daughter uh, just because of how she is as a creative and then I'll probably have another person that's very likely outside of us that would be that third level editor. Um, one of the things that I did, remember I told you about my grandfather, right? He didn't edit anything in that first book. What I did in my first books was kind of had a similar approach to where I had a focus of only about 90% accuracy in editing maybe 90%, probably more like 85 to 90. And the reason was I was not concerned about accuracy as much as it was I was concerned about the content and making sure I got that out and giving people an experience. Because what happens is the way that I use my books, I use them to where I actually draw people to my books as a resource rather than just trying to have the book as the main thing. So when you go back to the book, you're going to know pretty much the case that this is not 100% edited, but you, what I want you to focus on is the experience. I want to focus you on the flow that you're getting into, and I want you to have a discovery that can then move you into a demonstration of the utilization of that content. So there's a point where I'll get to that 100% editing and all that kind of stuff, which is that's pretty much where I am now with the books that are to come. But ultimately, that editing piece, it's like, I got to make sure I keep myself in that queue because there's this feel that I need to make sure exists in these books. Yeah. And, and I know you mentioned uh, last time we spoke about how important it is to keep your voice and to speak conversation yeah. to the point to where over time, people can hear your voice when they're reading your materials. And then that becomes kind of uh, like a hidden value. And that's why AI, AI can help with the editing. But really, you know, offloading it to AI to just write everything for you. And some people, that's their approach. But for your approach, yeah. use it for for the you know small pieces, and then really make sure your voice is is front and center. Absolutely. One of the things about that AI focus is I need it to be so specific, not only to my voice, but to this unique fingerprint that I have delivered, and that was specific to me. Because especially with the next generations that are going to use those, there's got to be no thing like that right. in their market, right? And what they build around that has to make them extremely special. So I need the, the artificial intelligence to be just a means of support to like back end stuff. And I need the imaginative 
human intellectual intelligence to be the front end of that. And that's the only way I can retain that is by making sure that I keep this level of touch point to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, the beauty of creating these books is that there's a longevity. There's a very long shelf life. We talked about Think and Grow Rich, how when I was, you know, 19, I kept it in my back pocket and dog-eared and highlighted, and I still have it on my bookshelf and read it, I don't know how many times. Um, and that book was written in, I think, 20s and 30s, somewhere in that ballpark. So these works, they they can go on well beyond you. I know you're talking about creating an intellectual property base. That intellectual property can then be turned into courses and workshops and all these different things. And more importantly, it becomes an asset for the family that the family family can do things with well beyond uh, your time here. And, and that most likely isn't going to happen if you just had the robots create everything for you, like every single word. Not at all, man. It there's There's this thing that, you know, in the context of that, I really did this more for, I want what I think, what I felt, what I experienced, the stories, the ideas, the exposures to be captured for these next generations, right? Like, I want them to know, like, how crazy it was, how exciting it was, how funny it was, all of that, right? And in that being the case, if you don't have that that melody, if you will, of those experiences and that reality. You know, I've said this to you, you know, I sing. And, you know, in singing, <laughs> you know, when I was, I've been singing since I was a little boy. And when I got to middle school, my mother, you know, I wanted to get in the band because I wanted to play saxophone, but she's like, no, you're going to be in the choir. And I was like, well, I sing all the time at church. You know why I got to do this? And so I ended up in the choir because I didn't have a say in it. And she goes and puts my brother in the band. He gets to play the trombone. I'm like, what is this? Anyway, so from that moment, though, I always go back to it because her making sure I was in the, the choir solidified me focusing on my voice in a certain way. Yeah. But also there was training that I got at that level that positioned me to not only understand the importance of my voice, but things you do to make sure you amplify your voice without having a microphone, right? Things you do to understand that your voice can make people feel a certain way and you can key in on those things. And so when it comes down to it, that aspect that you speak of, it's also that there's this sound and this rhythm and this experience that comes through the talk. Like my wife, she, I always mess with her. Like she loves my voice, but it literally puts her to sleep. It suits her. <laughs> like I get to talk in it, you know, whereas you might key in and you might wake up and be like, oh man, Leo, give her that stuff. She just goes. And... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, sp speaking of that, uh, how do you work with your family to give you the space to get into a creative zone? I know you're a father, you got kids. It's yeah. not always easy to find that quiet space to sit down and really get in the zone. Like, how do you create that space in your household? We, we've we created a precedent of like, this is what I do. This is what we do. This is a part of what we do. And so I've done it enough to where they know, okay, when he has to do this, he's going to tell us, hey, this is the time frame it's going to take to do that. Or this is how long I want to work on doing this. And, you know, it, it's just like when I was doing my master's studies, like you knew I had this project, I had this paper, whatever the case may be. And I've got to do that. So it's about one, communicating that. It's, a, it's about making sure that there's clarity about this is the expectation. There's there's one thing that I that we teach our children on a regular basis. And I I share this not only with them, but I keep this even in, you know, my professional experiences as well as even in the classroom. And it, it'll be a book in the near future. Um, th this will be just a little snippet for people. The book title will be uh, do this, 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 and that, right? Okay, so that that's a whole nother story because it, it kind of ties to the song I used to sing when I was in choir growing up. <laughs> but that's a it's a whole nother thing. It's pretty cool. But the the those four things are do what's expected, when it's expected, with the right attitude, tell the truth, right? And the truth part is 
making sure you tell yourself what the expectation is. And in order to tell yourself what the expectation is, you have to have clarity of the expectation, right? Which goes back to my first book, The Two Keys for Highly Exceptional Teams, Expectation and Responsibility. Okay, now with that, I try to make sure that I utilize, remember I told you experience, that I utilize those two keys, right? So I communicate the expectation to my family, right? I'm working on this book and I'm going to be actually putting pen to paper. I'm going to do these things and so on and so forth. And I should be done approximately by this time and so on and so forth because I've kind of dealt with it enough and they just let me be while I'm in my vacuum. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I'm going to come out. Communication. And again, it's it's about making sure there's clarity of the expectations so we all can take responsibility. And that's how you can be in highly exceptional team. Today, we have eight books that I've written, right? And they're part of that process because we've been a highly exceptional team as a result of leveraging those two keys. I love it. That's beautiful. Um, who would you recommend writes a book? Who would you recommend writes a book? Well, why should somebody consider writing a book? I know you touched upon like the immense value and the intellectual property, but there's a lot of people out there that maybe have a desire and just don't know how to get off the blocks or they're maybe nervous or scared or insecure. Mm -hmm. well, what is your advice or guidance to, to these people? There's two people I have in mind, but before I, I share that, I think it to be valuable to say, I was able to identify a hat in eliminating writer's block okay and and you mentioned it earlier and i didn't really touch on it but i think this is important in talking about the two people that come to mind who should write a book writer's block for me was in the context of typing or writing because again i don't write as fast as i think and talk i don't type as fast as i think and talk not in the long form in the short form it, it doesn't take me any time. Like I can literally take my time, you know, deal with, you know, communications, letters, stuff like that. It's sweet. But as it pertains to that long form, my thoughts, once I get to the point to put my thoughts on page, those words to page, like it's literally like a volcanic eruption. And I don't type that fast, right? Mm -hmm. And so for the people who are really listening to me and you feel like, you you think at a pace and talk at a pace that's consistent with the information you want to get out and you actually have it in your mind that you want to write a book, then you probably should write a book the way that I write a book by dictating it, right? And so the first person is the person who's thinking about a book in that way, right? If you're thinking about writing a book, that means you're supposed to do it. That's how I feel about it, right? Okay. Yeah. And so you need to actually be true to that. And it could be that you've been dealing with that writer's block of trying to type it out. And the, the words are, you know, way down the street in, you know, California, and you still in New Mexico. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you, you got to get with that. And so you need to get on the jet and stop trying to, you know, operate in your little buggy, okay? And the jet is get you a good microphone, and get you some Microsoft Word, go through some of the processes I talked about, and put those words to page, all right? The second person that should write a book is someone who says, I want to make an impact, I have a message, but they don't have anything to point to. Mm, that's great. Right? Th this is one of the things that corresponds to why I said I don't care about being a bestseller because we live in a day and time to where that has a totally different meaning than it used to have. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, going through the Thomas Nelson's and the big time publishers, the New York times, and you know, th that's great. It still has its place, but it does not have the weight that it used to have. You need to have more authority about your work than anybody else. And the fact that we are in this environment where you don't have to ask for permission you may have to get approval, like through the platform and all those types of things, but you don't have to ask for permission to do it, right? And so if you're that type of person that you you have a message and you have something that you're talking about, like it's so valuable to be able to point to something that's external of you. Like that was such a freedom for me to be able to 
say, hey, why don't you go get my book instead of me sit here and talk to you for an hour? <laughs> like, yeah. I talk about this. Matter of fact, it's in my book. So why don't you go check that out? Yes, I can make a sale, but I've actually done them a, a very solid service. Why? Because I made it to where they can take this with them wherever they go. I can't go with them wherever they go, but they could at least take this little piece of perspective that would be valuable for them. So if you got a message, put it in a package to where then you can take that package and you can actually expand it. Because like I said, you can take a book and make it into so many different things, right? You can take one book and make it into several ebooks, right? You can take those several ebooks and then turn them into different, you know, segments in a course. Like it's so many different things you can do. So if you are somebody who has a message, put it in a book. Man. That's good stuff, isn't it? I think that's a mic drop right there. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that was very powerful stuff. I mean, tons of nuggets here. How do people get in contact with you? What's the best way for people to find you and work with you? Yeah, so you can look me up on social media in these four different platforms. One, uh, Instagram, Leo Simpson, the second. So it's, that'll be Leo Simpson II, um, which is lowercase i or capital I, whichever one you prefer. Uh, Facebook, same thing. YouTube, same thing. And then my LinkedIn, you can follow me there as well. And I, I tend to have a little bit of overlap of my content and whatnot, but you can absolutely see what I'm putting out there. Uh, one thing I'll share, you know, with regard to working with me, one of the things that I was asked in a podcast that I was a part of, and this was really cool. I ended up as a result of the 21 day challenge we did, I got invited to actually speak on this podcast wow. and consistency was one of the things that this guy is focusing on for this year. And so when he saw that consistency, we had already connected at, at another event. He saw that consistency. He was like, man, I got to bring you on because you bring in some solid value and so on and so forth. Well, he asked me this question at the end, you know, why should people work with you? And I answered the question, but I walked away because I'm such an introspective and reflective person. I was like, I don't feel like I really answered that question for the benefit of those people, right? And so I actually did a, a live, you know, I do my lives every day on Instagram and then, you know, I restream it to, you know, those other three platforms. And it was on that subject matter of why should people work with you, right? And ultimately it was this. It's because I'm going to help people expose and eliminate the voids that keep them from actually experiencing the wellness that they desire in their work, their family, and identity. Because I'm going to exhaust my value upon your voids to help you replace the chaos, the frustration, the confusion in your work, family, and identity with wellness. And so if you look me up on those platforms, I promise you, you're going to get some of that good value. Leo, you're the man. Thank you for doing this uh, again. And uh, look forward to all your future books and writings and continuing to work with you. Appreciate you. Now, you said it again. You need to tell everybody why we said well, again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we did this before and uh, the recording didn't come through. So I'm glad we had a chance to do it a second time because <laughs> I actually had to call you hand in hat, uh, hat in hand, as they say. Oh, uh, the recording was lost, but uh I mean, you're just chock full of nuggets and gems, and I'm so stoked. Appreciate that we it, brother. Appreciate it. So thanks again. Absolutely.